In our faith, he, for our faith, he convicts us of what he's telling us is true. And, and that's the prayer offered in faith. So what, it, what does Elijah do? Uh, he, he says, go see. I don't see anything. Go look again. Finally, uh, at, at the end of uh, like, like about seven times, and I'll go back over this story. The servant says, well, there's a, there's a cloud way out there. Way out there. And Elijah says, Ahab, get moving because it's going to rain, but it's going to pour. So he's convicted that what God says is true, and he acts on that. That's what faith is. So, uh, that's, so there are things that I'm convicted about. You and I are convicted about. I'm convicted that I'm going to get a glorified body. Say, have you seen it? No. You got any, what's the evidence that you have that you have a glorified body? What God has said. And uh, what he's said in his word, and I'm trusting that. Okay? And so what, what happens is we continue to trust God. It's like, again, when we go, go work out, and uh, when we go work out, our muscles get stronger. And so our faith gets stronger as we trust God day by day in what he's saying to us. So we're looking at now uh, James chapter 5 and verse 13. We're talking about the prayer offered in faith. So verse 13, is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Okay. So as we're looking at James 5, 13, is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Well, anybody, you, see, you, you okay. So what happens is in the Christian life, we're going to be, we, we, we will suffer. We will be suffering some things. Because the, the Bible, was, Paul tells Timothy, yes, this is true. And if anyone uh, lives godly in Christ Jesus, he will suffer persecution. Anyone who lives godly. That's a biblical fact. And that's what James is talking about. And uh, when he talk about, talks about the prayer of faith, is anyone among you suffering? Often because we have Americanized the thinking that we're not supposed to have any problems whatsoever. We don't, we don't suffer. But we suffer living godly. If you live godly, you're going to suffer persecution. That, that, that's just a biblical fact. So what James is saying, so when you start to suffer because of your life as a Christian, then we need to pray. Okay? Any comments? Understanding? We look. So, if you live for, if you live for Christ, you will suffer. Now, living living in America, we haven't suffered nearly as much as people across the across the sea, and in other countries. But uh, more and more is coming upon us. But if you suffer, I remember again working uh, for General Motors, and I love working for for General Motors. But I was also a union worker. But there are times I had to make a decision. And so, and you suffer because you make a decision. I can't do that. I need to do what Christ is calling me to do. And so uh, now people talk about you, different things. You know, so if you live for Christ in an ungodly world, you're going to suffer persecution. Did you have your hand up? Okay. All right. So. Here's what he says. So realize this. This, this is the way it's going to be. So what, what happens when you start suffering? Paul says in Romans 8, 18, the suffering of the present age is not worthy to be compared with the glory that's to be revealed in us. So Paul says, uh, later on he tells Timothy, if we suffer, we're going to reign. And so suffering is not that I'm doing something I'm suffering because of, because of disobedience. It's the fact of because I'm a Christian. You know, and as we said before, there are times I run into opposition with people who felt that I should be doing something else than what I was doing because of, but I said, but I'm relating to my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and that's what I'm going to do. And uh, so when you do that, you will face one degree or another degree of suffering. Any comments? I, I, I get you. No, go, go ahead, Sister Betty.
Yeah. Amen. And, and again, and what happens is, again, that's what he's talking about, the suffering of persecution. Sometimes it's verbal. Sometimes it's, uh, you know, uh, you lose friends or whatever. But, but so what James is saying is anybody, because this is what's going to happen with us, anybody, uh, is anybody suffering, he said, pray. And what we're praying is to get the will of God. So, brother, were you saying something? Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Say that again. Solomon. Yeah, Solomon. Oh. Go ahead. I'm trying to. Oh, okay. All right. I, I got you. Yeah, Solomon. Uh, and then, yeah, but Solomon learned a lot because of his own mistakes. <laughs> yeah, so Solomon uh, is a good point. Uh, Jesus is, is the real example of all that. Never done anything wrong, but he suffered persecution because when he, when he spoke the truth in love, when he told the truth, that's what happened, that they came against him. And so uh, what happens in the long run, as uh, our sister, uh, she, would never, she never would brag about herself, but I brag about her. Yeah, our sister over here was who's who in Youngstown. Yeah, I went to the ceremony, who's who in Youngstown State University. You'll find her there. Who's who? And one of the things people said about her, the women said about her, is she wouldn't let us act whorishly. <laughs> Watch it. You got to dress better than that, you know. <laughs> and uh, so at the end of all that, uh, you know, they, they recognized her and they thought well of her. But in the meantime, you, you, you know, you're looking at how you live in your Christian life. And people will come against you because uh, when you're looking at what the Bible says and people want to do opposite of the Bible, you'll find yourself suffering. Uh, and the suffering there is not physical suffering. He's talking about suffering for the cause of Christ. Yes, sir. <laughs> I appreciate that. A amen. Amen. So what we're looking at uh, this is to say that if you're going to live godly in Christ, you're going to run against some, uh, some opposition. Yeah. And, uh, so there were times people came to me and said, you need to slow, I was a production worker, slow down your production. Why? Because we don't like what's, what happened the other day. I said, but we have a contract. In the contract, if we have a complaint, here's what we do. We call our representative. We do this, we do that. I ain't doing, we ain't doing that. And you're a crucial guy. We want you to shut it, slow it down, stop. And I said, uh, before I work for the, for the company and before I work as a union worker, I'm a servant of Jesus Christ. I cannot in good conscience do what you're saying. And so what happens is that, uh, yeah, you, you suffer. You know, because people look at you and, and uh, they, they treat you differently because you're looking at representing Christ. You're looking at James 5.13. So James says, is any among you suffering? And the point I'm trying to make as Christians, especially in our time, 2024, the worse things get, we're going to suffer as Christians. Amen. And uh, so, and how about, you know, parents are suffering uh, because they, if they stand up and, uh, you know, they, people were called, uh, uh, was that, terrorists because they were interested in what our children are being, their children were being taught and they didn't want certain things. I saw something the other day. Uh, talking about how bad it is to ban books. Well, not if it's pornography and you're talking to a sixth grader. 
I, I mean, a six-year-old, a seven-year-old. No, I don't want my children involved in that. No way. And so more and more, if, if we stand for the cause of Christ, there is suffering. So this is not suffering because I, I, got a, uh, you know, I got a bad doctor's report or this happened or that. It's because who I, how I live. And the more I proclaim the claims of Christ. Somebody was asking, we were talking about this not too long ago. Uh, ago and No, this, I was at a meeting on Monday with pastors. And someone, well, they said, how, how did God, and we we're trying to figure out why and how did God harden Pharaoh's heart? Because he, he hardened Pharaoh's heart. He, said, uh, he, he hardened his heart by, by pressing the claims that these are my people. I said, when he came to Pharaoh and he says, Moses, you go tell Pharaoh, these are my people. Let them go. They're going to worship me. Pharaoh's heart got hard. And God owned Yeah, I hardened it. He said, because they're my people. And I'm, t- and I'm saying, this is what I want done. And so when he tells uh, Moses to go back, then he hardens Pharaoh's heart because he continues to press his claims that I'm God. These are my people. And I can call for them. Uh, uh, you know, whenever, however I want, they belong to me. They were going to belong to you. And so that's the issue. What happens is uh, when uh, I see all the time, 50 years of uh, walking with the Lord, when God claims his right to be God, some human beings, they get upset. He can't do that. Well, uh, you know, I got my rights. So you, you, you hear that a lot today as we're looking at the election coming up. People are talking about their rights. But you say, well, God has sovereign rights. I remember telling somebody not too long ago, Psalm 24 says, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. Well, uh, you mean God, <laughs> God created all this? It's his. Can he claim it? Now, you're starting to get upset, but you claim, uh, you know, you claim what you want to claim as a soul owner. So we're looking at this um, James chapter 5 and verse uh, 13, the first part. Is anyone among you suffering? The idea is living for Christ has that caused you uh, some negative feedback. Go ahead, my sister. Okay. And so I'm like, I can't do that. And so I didn't do that. And like every time, it's like I had never been written up a day in my life until I got to that company with the people who had fake numbers. And it's like every time I would look up, like it's either the end of uh, the month or whenever they get the report, I said, um, here it comes. Guess I get ready. You know, you know that um, 
Amen. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we think about the first part of this verse, we come to you. And again, we thank you for so great a salvation. You're, you have saved our souls. You are continuing to sanctify us, causing us to be set apart to your will, to your word, to the Holy Spirit's conviction in our lives. And so we know that in this group, there are those who are either going to be suffering or are suffering right now, or they will be for the cause of Christ. So we pray for those who are making decisions that are bring you glory and honor and cause them to grow closer to you. We pray for those who are making these decisions. Empower us by your spirit that we would trust you. Remember we, we, last week we, we, we were talking about singing this song, we've come this far by faith, leaning on the Lord. We're trusting in your holy word. You have never failed us yet. So thank you, Lord. Continue to lead us and guide us in the path of righteousness and holiness and truth for your name's sake. As, as Jeremiah would say in the ninth chapter, unto you be glory, Father. As James would say, help us to decide that uh, it's better to uh, line up with you and the people of God. And we used to sing a song, I'm going through with the Lord's despised few. There, there are few of us, Father, who understand that uh, the road may get tough, the going is rough, but yet you are, when we're with you, God and one is the majority. So as we're either have gone through suffering or, or we are going through suffering or that we will go through suffering. Father, we pray that we would, like James 1 says, if any of us uh, lack wisdom, let us ask of you because you will give us all that we need and then some and you will not chasten us uh, because we've asked for wisdom. Thank you, Lord. You give it liberally and uh, so you lead us and guide us in the way that we should go. We give you the glory and the honor, give you the praise. We understand that in living this Christian life, there will, uh, there's, there's never going to be the absence of suffering. We're going to face trouble. As one songwriter said, there's trouble in my way. We may even cry sometimes. Lay awake at night. But Lord, we know that you'll be with us as what was being said in the testimonies. We honor you and give you the glory and we praise you. Thank you, Lord, for being with us. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So if you're suffering for the cause of Christ, pray. Lord, give me wisdom. Give me guidance. But if you, but if you stand for the Lord, praise God. Praise his holy name. Now the next part says, is anyone cheerful? Let him sing songs. All right. Anybody cheerful today? <laughs> me too. I'm cheerful. <laughs> I'm cheerful. <laughs> you cheerful Sunday? All right. And so those those times come. So so in the balance, there are times when we do suffer for the cause of Christ, and there are other times we, we're cheerful. And one of the things I like to do is thank God for answered prayer. So you look and and, and Valerie was going through some stuff, uh, Maxine, we go on and on and and, and how many times has God delivered? Thank you, Father. Amen. Praise your holy name. You've been go ahead, go ahead, Bevan.
<laughs> you been, you're challenging your sister, huh? Yeah, I got you. That there's a song that we sometimes sing: "Think about His love, and think about His goodness, think about His grace that's brought us through." Yeah. So when you think about Him, yeah. So uh, yeah. So so my my favorite story was that uh, I was going to Santa Barbara, California. I was set up with another guy at an apartment. That's where I was going. And so uh, I remember telling my wife, "I'm going. I'm going to California." I don't like this place. I don't like this area. I'm going to California. And I remember one day after the Lord had set me up and saved me and called me here and all that, I said, well, I got to Girard, far west as I got. I got one went from Youngstown to Girard, which is west. <laughs> I, didn't get no, I never got to California. <laughs> so, but uh, with God, I'm, I'm content, satisfied. Amen. And I look at it now, I say, man, I thank God I'm not in California. Yeah, so, uh, so I, I got what you're saying. We're talking about following the Lord. So, and I, again, and I appreciate what our brother Lenny said about, it, it, it's, I mean, I don't, I'm not looking for persecution. I don't want nobody to hurt me. If it comes, I prayerfully ask the Lord to help me deal with it, you know. But uh, in the meantime, what I try to do is make every decision that I make is one where I try to stay in the will of God. And so whatever comes, it, it, it happens. So, but right now, the number of us are cheerful, right? Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise God. Remember, Psalm 27, 14, I think, David said, I, uh, he said, I would have given up, you know, in this Christian life. I'd have given it up. But I believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord while I'm alive. Woo! <laughs> In the land of the living. Hallelujah! I told a guy recently, I said, I understand where you're coming from, and I ain't mad at you, but you've never seen the goodness of God. I have. He's good. Verse 14. Now notice, is anyone among you sick? So we had suffering, <laughs> cheerful. Is anyone among you sick? All right. And let me go back. Uh, we look at these verses. I made a note here. One of the verses says, uh, the word suffering, again, when we're dealing with trouble that comes because we know Christ. And uh, so we're called to uh, endure hard times. We don't look at this one scripture Paul wrote to Timothy. He says, Timothy is a good soldier. Now, since I was drafted in the army, I understand what it means to be a soldier. It's three years in the army. As a good soldier, endure hardness. <laughs> endure hardness. Yeah, I remember uh, when, I, when I got drafted, and I had to go downtown to the post office, downtown Youngstown and all that. And uh, I ended up, uh, they uh, got me on a plane, and uh, I went to Georgia. Uh, they took me to Cleveland, got on a plane, ended up in uh, Georgia, Fort, uh, I can't, Fort Benning, Georgia. Got me to bed about 1 o'clock in the morning, and at 5 o'clock, they turned the lights on and started, get up! I said, we, we, we only been here four hours, <laughs> traveling all day. Get up, soldier! <laughs> One of, one of my friends, was he was in the second berth, you know, and uh, they the, the turned the lights on, and the sergeant screamed, get out! He fell out the second, floor, uh, second berth. Yeah, and, they, and they got us running. I'm saying, man, he said, you're in the Army. 
you're in the army. No matter what time you got in, if uh, Reveille is five o'clock, you better. I mean, so I learned in the army there's some disciplines that you know they, that you're going you're gonna to live according to. Uh, otherwise, you, you know, you're facing, and nobody wants to be in the guardhouse. Or, or, you know, facing all these other consequences. But uh, so every time I read that scripture where Paul says, be, be, you know, endure hardness as a good soldier. Yeah, as a soldier, you don't expect it to be that easy. You're a soldier. So I, when our sister sings, uh, I'm a soldier. I love it. Yeah, I'm a soldier. Because a soldier, is, uh, you, uh, you don't expect it to be living in a penthouse somewhere, and every, somebody's serving you. You're a soldier in the army of Christ. So, he, so Paul says, uh, if, if you're sick, now, now we're looking at some kind of physical sickness or whatever, weakness, whatever this sickness, he said, let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Now, okay, you're sick. So, one of the things I do when I start, if I, if I get sick, I'm going to pray. Lord, is this, uh, are you trying to get my attention about something I'm missing? Because Paul was, was, you know, Paul says in Corinthians that when people were disobedient concerning the Lord's Supper, he said, some of you are weakly, weakly, they're weak. Some of you are sickly. Some even have, have left here. You went on to be with the Lord. So if sickness comes, then he says, uh, let him call for the elders of the church. So you want people praying for you. Regardless, of, so if I'm sick, yeah, I'm going to call somebody. I'm going to tell them. Yeah, hey, brother, I'm, 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 I got some problems here. Would you pray for me? Pray with me. And one of the first thing I want to uh, understand is that because I'm disobedient in some area, the Lord may have been telling me to do something. I'm not doing it. Lord, am I missing the mark? Am I... So, and, that's, and this is biblical. I'm sick. So, my, uh, so once I checked that out and I called for the elders, I remember when my wife was sick with cancer. And we, we were down in, in uh, South Carolina. And so I, I walked up and, you know, I've always got these baseball caps. And, and so uh, the, the lady at, at the counter says, oh, I like your hat. And uh, I said, well, praise the Lord. And so she, uh, she's talking, this is about 14 years ago. She says, I'm a Christian too. She says, we got a prayer group. You got a prayer group? Yeah, we got a prayer group all across uh, South Carolina. Would you pray for my wife? My wife said, oh, you tell everybody. You, you always, everybody. Every Christian you meet, you tell them I'm sick. I said, because I want everybody to be praying for you. I ain't too proud to beg. Hallelujah. <laughs> Anybody sick? I'm calling the elders. Because the effectual, fervent prayers of the righteous is what James is, is saying. Call for the elders and let them pray over him. So Jesus said, Father, I know you always hear me. And I say, Father, I know you hear me when I ask according to your will. But Lord, I'm calling on a lot of elders, the, the leaders, the, the church members. Father, I'm calling them and asking, would you pray for me? Because I'm struggling. I'm sick. I want to make sure it's not because I'm missing something. He says, and let them pray. Ooh. Uh, it felt so good to know that I had people all over the country praying for my wife. Everywhere she's on a list. Because I'm trusting in this word. Let them pray. And it says anointing him with oil. We run into a controversial situation with, with this. Back in that day, though, remember when Jesus told the story of the Good Samaritan pouring in oil, you know, and so with the wounds and everything. So yeah, I let them pray over him. And I've done both. People have asked me, uh, they were praying for me and they anointed me with oil. Would you mind? We, uh, go ahead, help yourself. <laughs> Yeah, anoint me with oil. And at the same time, we want to pray in the will of God. It's anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Now, we can pray in the name of the Lord with or without the anointing oil. But those who decide that they want, they, they want the anointing, I got no problem with that. And those who say, well, you know, that 
uh, I'm praying in the name of the Lord. I got no problem with that. Because if we ask anything according to his will, one of the things the Lord helped me to understand, look, don't be fighting your Christian brothers. So here you are sick. You want to get healed. Somebody, and, and, uh, the, some people who are members here at the church for a while from a Pentecostal setting, they brought me some oil to pray for me. Pastor, can we pray for you? They know it in my head with oil and so forth. Yes, ma'am, you can pray. I, I receive it. I accept it. You know, so I'm not going into a doctrinal, ex, a doctrinal exposition. Well, let me tell you what that means in Scripture. <laughs> That's arrogance. You see what I'm saying? Uh, so what we do is, I mean, Jesus met the woman at the well, and, wh- and whatever they, she found and they found in common, they started talking about. And so Jesus starts talking in, in, uh, about the well, about the woman, and he, met, he mentions not too soon after they get going, Jacob's well. Oh, you know Jacob? Yeah. Well, we know Jacob. Samaritans and Jews, we, uh, you know, we, uh, we like Jacob. Now, he started with something in common. And then, then later on, it, it gets to the, to the real spiritual matter. And he tells her everything about her. She leaves her water pot, goes running to the men of the city, or to the men of the city. And I always like that. She said, hey, you guys, you think you, you think you macho? Yeah, yeah. You think you, uh, you, you think you're the Mac? Let me come see a man. <laughs> he didn't touch her. He didn't mal- manipulate her. He didn't you know, he said, come see a real man. <laughs> Lord, laid that scripture on my heart. He said, uh, he says, the women, the women in the church, the women in the community ought to see you as a man who's not trying to manipulate them, not trying to do something with them, but a real man that can touch their souls and never touch you, never touching them with your hands or whatever to manipulate, to try to get, in, get ahead. A man. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. When my granddaughter got to a certain age, she said, Grandpa, what do you think about this guy? He ain't no man. I can tell looking at him, what, 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 what he's trying to, he wants to manipulate you. He wants, he want, he's talking about, it. he wants to use you for his pleasure and his purpose. It ain't about you. And when, and when he gets his pleasure and purpose, he'll move on. He ain't no man, real man. I told somebody after we learned that, I said, listen, uh, it ain't, it's not being a man when you can have 20, 25, 60, 70, 80, 80 women. It's not being a man. I said, you know what? A real man can take one woman and live with her throughout all the rest of his life. And never, that's a man. Come and see a man. Woo! <laughs> That's why, the, that's why they talked about Jesus and Mary Magdalene and some of the others. Because the, the sinful man can't imagine women being that close with you and you not manipulating them. So. Thank you. Amen. Amen. That's a mouthful, my brother. Thank you, Father. Thank you. Verse 15. And the prayer of faith will save the sick. So, so notice what he's saying there in a situation that has come up. Okay, so if I'm suffering, I need to pray about my situation, trusting the Lord. If I'm cheerful, then I need to give God glory and praising. Okay, and then he says, uh, and if I'm sick, 
than the prayer offered in faith where God has convicted me of certain things and I'm going to, and so what James talks about is that prayer will save the sick, but we don't stop there. Often people say the prayer of faith will save the sick. Don't stop there. And the Lord will raise him up, okay? And if he has committed sins, he will, he will be forgiven. You got to take all those together. Are you with me? And, and so uh, my brother Marlon and I were, were listening, looking at uh, Daniel this morning, Daniel 9. And when and in Daniel's prayer, Daniel starts confessing the sins of his people. You start in Daniel 9, 1, he gets a vision. He confesses his sin. He's very much in line with the Lord. And the Bible says in Daniel chapter 9, if you read Daniel chapter 9, uh, the angel says, you are greatly beloved. He's beloved because he's, he's confessed his sins. He's, uh, co he's agreeing with God about uh, how they live their lives. He's trusting in the Lord. And the Lord comes and says, you are greatly beloved. And what I say to uh, people, yeah, we know John 3, 16. God loves the world. But in Daniel's day, Daniel was obedient to the word of God. And because he's obedient and he's not, he's not really asking for anything, he's confessing how wrong they were. And the problems that they were having was because they had turned their back on God. And the angel says, you're greatly beloved. And so one of the things Jesus says about this in John 14, the one who loves them is the one who has his word and keeps it. And so people, people tell me all the time, I love the Lord, but, you, but you're disobedient. If you love the, Jesus said, if you love me, you keep my commandments, my Father and I will be evident in your life. You, you'll see it. I, I will give you everything you need to see that we're in your life. And so the prayer of faith will save the sick. Not maybe. The prayer offered in faith where I'm trusting God and of confessing uh, my sins, it will save the sick, and the Lord will raise me up, and, see, all these go together, and if I've committed sins, he will, uh, he will be forgiven. That's the whole thing. Often we just stop at the first part of the verse and say, if you pray in faith, pray, pray hard enough, then God's going to answer, he's going to say yes. You're missing what the whole verse is saying in the whole context of James 5. James is talking about a man who is obedient to God. God sends him to the brook, and the brook dries up. Well, a brook is not going to sustain you but for so long. In a famine, the brook dries up. And then the, the ravens feed him. And then later on in chapter 18, he says, go tell Ahab. He's an obedient father. I mean, he's an obedient servant to our heavenly father. And with that in mind, See, I realize in my life when, that, when there's things going wrong, I need to confess. And I say, you know, the Lord convicts me of faith the same way he convicts me of sin. You see, when I'm, when, when I'm not doing what I'm supposed to do, ain't nobody got to tell me, hey, it's Julius. The Holy Spirit's going to, I can't sleep. I can't eat right. Until I get it right with God. And, I'm it. and so, and, and that's the idea that uh, all of us are, are, are going to sin and come short of the glory of God. So the Lord, is, I know when the Lord has convicted me of sin. I ain't got to ask nobody. <laughs> I think it's in genuine or something. Hey, Pastor Davis, uh, yeah. can I do this? Why do you want to go that far? <laughs> can I do this and still be saved? What? Why don't you walk straight in the middle of the, of, the, of, the, of the straight and narrow? Why are you trying to get as far off as... Uh, can I say that your attitude is wrong already? You see what I'm saying? But the, but the right attitude. So the prayer of faith, a prayer offered in faith, and uh, will we'll save the sick. And the, prayer, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. So that, that, that's, that's how we deal with the prayer of faith. Lord, is there anything in my life that's inconsistent with my relationship with you? Help me to get it right now. And uh, I've learned through, the, through these years that 
Diso I mean, was that delayed obedience is disobedience. Lord, I'll get this done next week. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I remember talking with some people, and, I, and uh, some and people asked me, I tell them, no, I stay in trouble because of what the Bible says. I had a, I had a couple uh, say to me, uh, they're, they're living together, and I said, well, you know, that's wrong. Okay, so but we want you to marry us. And I said, so when are you going to get married? Oh, we're going, we're going, we plan on getting married in about six, eight months. What are you going to do the rest of the time? Thank you, my brother. We're going, we're going to stay living together because we're going to get married. Well, I ain't marrying you. So the next six or eight months, you, you, you're going to be disobeying God. And, you, and uh, well, we got, we're going to get married, but we can't get married now. You, you can get married right now if you... If, and you can have you can have your, all your festivities later on, but you need to get right with God today. And so, someone said to me, "That's why you don't marry a whole lot of people. You got too many rules." <laughs> I said, "Yeah, but the ones I marry stay married." <laughs> What's verse sixteen say? Confess your trespasses to one another. See, that's another part of this. Confess your trespasses. The Bible tells us all sin is trespass. And so confess your trespasses one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of, the, of a righteous man avails much. By the way, any comments so far? Thank you, my brother. Appreciate it, man. Yeah, and so confess your trespasses. And uh, go ahead. So back in fourteen when it says no to God, the whole thing is kind of what happened. And why does it say no to him? Is it because you know no means you're thinking of uh mature That's exactly right. So is it you know, when we think of this in the scripture, does it have to do with the whole thing of confess the trespasses? Oh, yeah, you got to, what I say is you got to follow the whole process, 13, 14, 15, and 16. Elders, the reason he says elders is because you want spiritually mature people uh, to, to pray for you. And, and, and it's not negating women. But, so, uh, and you go back to James 1, he says you're looking for wisdom. If you're really looking for wisdom and you ask, God's going to give you wisdom. And so, but one of the things that t t uh, tells me that I'm asking in a righteous way and I'm serious about it is that uh, I'm calling the elders and then here I'm confessing my trespasses to one another and we pray for one another that, we, that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayers of a righteous man avails much. Also, it helps with humility. In America, we don't want anybody to know our business. So... Uh, you know, how you doing? Everybody come to church. Everybody, you know, good morning, brother. How you doing? Oh, man, I'm blessed. I'm doing good. Everything is going fine. And, and, you, and you know it's not, okay? But so the part of the humility is to realize, you know what? I kind of messed up. I need to get right with God. And uh, so one of the things that helped me really develop a better relationship was my wife was confessing it to other people. You know, I've been wrong. I've been I've been arrogant, man. I I need prayer, and 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 then you get healed, physically, emotionally, psychology, you know, psychologically, you get healed, and so he says, confess your trespasses. So we we like to hide stuff, but the humility of saying, I have blown it, I I have messed up. Confess your trespasses to one another, and pray for one another that you may be healed. When you start to humbly realize and you tell people, and one of the things, especially as pastors, I've talked with pastors, and so you don't want your congregation to know you struggle with stuff because they won't trust you. Say, look, my, my congregation, no, I'm just a man. Like, like Elijah, I'm just a man. Uh, that, but, uh, but I got the spirit of God in me, but they know I'm, a, I'm not I'm somebody who's never sinned. I've sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And there are times that, you know, in my life, I've done wrong after I got saved. And so you're asking for prayer. Go ahead, my sister.
Amen. Amen, my sister. Amen. Because, look, uh, ain't nobody in French that think I'm perfect. <laughs> you don't think I'm perfect, do you? Do you? <laughs> Go ahead, my brother. <laughs> Excuse me. Amen. Good word, my brother. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So, yes, go ahead. James 5. And so, and the idea of the prayer offered in faith is we're trusting the, what the Lord has said to us, what he's convicted us of. And so, again, I go back to Hebrews 11.1. 1. Faith is the reality or the substance of things hoped for. It's the conviction of things not seen. And the, so, in, in the Hebrews 11, if you study through Hebrews 11, there never is anyone who initiates this. Gideon doesn't decide, I got 32,000 men, and here's my idea. I'm going to cut it down to 300. That wasn't his idea. God told him what to do. You know, uh, Abel offered a, a more excellent sacrifice. God told him what to do. And so uh, Noah didn't decide, these people are wicked. I'm going to build a boat and make it rain. God told him what to do. And so what I'm saying is that so when I, when I read through uh, James 5, and I look at verses uh, 13, 14, 15, and 16, and you look at you say, so here's a prescription of how I need to relate to God. And if I do that, I've covered all the bases. And the, and the prayer offered in faith will save the sick. And he says, and so in verse uh, 16, I thank everybody for, for all their, their participation, but, but again, confess your trespasses to one another. And I, I re never realized how arrogant I was when God told me, to, you know, he says, go in and, and tell your wife, you confess that you have sinned and you were wrong. And, and the first time I, I did that, and uh, she was back in the bedroom and I was in the kitchen, the Holy Spirit convicted me, you go tell her you was wrong. Tell her you sinned. And I walked back there and I says, uh, how you doing, honey? <laughs> and and, and it, it, I struggled. I couldn't, I couldn't come up with it. I, I left. I left the room and come back, and the Holy Spirit said, "I told you what to do. You don't go do that." And it took me a while. I'm stuttering at all this. I can't get it out because I, was, I, I used to. My pattern was I could get my wife to agree with me by appeasing her, 
and she knew I was wrong, but she would accept it. So I'd start talking nice and doing some things, and the, and the Holy Spirit said, that ain't good enough. Confess you sinned. <laughs> it shocked her. <laughs> she didn't know how to take it. <laughs> because, you, you know, we learn how to manipulate and, and say things in such a way. And so uh, at that time, I, I never told her I was wrong about anything. Yeah, I had an explanation. But then, but then uh, the Lord showed me, he says, yeah, that's humility. Now. And then that's what Calvary love is. Calvary love is, is stretched out wide, and you're not, you're not holding on to nothing. Stretched out wide. And, and, and confess your sins your, to one another. Pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Amen. Look at verse 17. James 5, 17. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. He, was, he wasn't special in the sense that he wasn't no superhuman being. He wasn't Batman, Superman. Uh, what's the other guy? Spider-Man. <laughs> Incredible Hulk. <laughs> Six million dollar man. Yeah, he's a man with a nature like ours. And he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. Amen. Amen. See, when we honor and own God and we, and we align ourselves with his will, uh, God will do exceedingly and abundantly above all we ask or imagine. Amen? Amen. And, that, and, that, and so that's what we're looking at. People get frustrated sometimes. They say, well, I prayed and I trusted it didn't happen. Well, if you follow James 5, 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17, and you get lined up with God, you find out that it will happen. It, it will happen. And uh, so... And again, I say this, uh, that when my wife passed away, God told me, uh, he says, I know you prayed for healing, you trusted me, you believed me, you didn't do anything wrong, but you, you and your wife had a greater prayer, and I answered that greater prayer. That greater prayer, he said, said both of you wanted to be, be men and women of faith. You want to be a man of faith, you want to be a woman of faith. And I allowed you to go through stuff where you trusted me even when you didn't know what was going on. So I answered that prayer. You're, you know, you are, you and your wife were a person of faith. Secondly, you always, you both of you pray, Lord, may we be, glor may you be glorified in our lives. May you, may you be glorified in our lives. And what happened? He says, I did that. People came from everywhere to, uh, to see your wife. And uh, she magnified my name because she said, I'm in a win-win situation. They couldn't figure, well, how can your wife take all this? I sat in the doctor's, uh, the doctor's office one time, and the doctor said, you know, actually what, my, what, what I recommended for you didn't help you, it hurt you. I apologize to you. And Marcia said, I'm in the Lord's hands. I'm in a win-win situation. She said, I'm a Christian too. I learned something from this. I'm going to trust God. So uh, God says, I, so I answered your, your, your higher prayer that's going to impact eternity. I answered it. And I said, Lord, I see it now. I never saw it before. So you wax bold and you trust the Lord because the Lord is never going to fail us. Amen. Amen. And he always, as, as believers, he always gives us what be what's best. I learned that I was looking, Jesus says, if you ask for bread, you don't get a fish. Or, I mean, if you ask for fish, you don't get a, a serpent. I said, but sometimes it may look like. <laughs> but it's not. It's, what, it's what's best for us. He always does what's best for us. One o'clock. So we did a little, little different today. Uh, 
Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for our time together. So we, we pray that if anybody is suffering, we, we also want to make sure we pray, Lord, thank you for answered prayer. We, we bless you. We sing psalms. What an awesome God you are. And then, Father, uh, uh, if, if we're sick, we want to make sure we humble ourselves, confess our sins and trespasses, make sure we get right with you, tell the spiritual people in our churches and our families to pray. And so we all pray together as we line up in alignment with you and your word. And we thank you, Father, for working in us both to will and to do of your good pleasure. We ask all this in Jesus' name for his sake. Amen. Amen. Thanks for coming, everybody. Praise the Lord. I am redeemed, bought with a price. Amen.